For this program, we visited the city of Oshawa on the shores of Lake Ontario, just northeast of Toronto, Canada. The giant General Motors Oshawa assembly plant is home of the Buick Regal and Century models. Recently, Ian Doran, who of course is no stranger to know-how audiences, traveled there from his office in Flint and spoke to the people who perform quality evaluations and make repairs to the cars on the production line. Hi, I'm Chuck McLennan for Buick Know How. As you'll be aware after watching this program, the build quality of Regal and Century models leaving the Oshawa assembly plant has been exceptionally high since the very beginning of production. In fact, the conditions we'll be describing are rare and apply only to very early production cars, so most of them you'll probably never see at the dealership. But if you do encounter a very early model with one of these conditions present, it may be difficult to diagnose. For that reason, we once again tapped into the knowledge of the quality experts at the plant to provide you with some tips on conditions they've observed and repaired since production startup. The first place Ian visited was the water test area where he spoke with Brian Terry, the Oshawa plant water leak expert. Brian began by showing us some possible locations where water might enter the trunk. First leak that we got, it's right here. It's called the parcel shelf. Right? Okay. On the parcel shelf, usually there's a seam that's been skipped, okay? The metal's good, but it's just been an operator insulation area and it's just been skipped. This is One possible source for a water leak in early and sometimes current production cars is the seam on the partial shelf gutter below the rear window. Brian explained that water tends to run from the seam along the underside of the parcel shelf and down behind the carpet. It accumulates at the lowest point on the floor of the trunk. Or sometimes the water from this leak may also drip from this edge directly onto the carpet. To confirm a leak at this and other locations, Brian uses a compressed air gun with a long extension nozzle to blow behind the seam while he sprays the area with a soap and water solution. If there's even a very small pinhole, the soap bubbles will quickly confirm the leak condition. The repair for this leak is also pretty straightforward. Dry the area and apply some clear seam sealer and work it into the seam. When the sealer is dry, you can use the air hose and soap solution to check that the leak is repaired or run the hose over the area and check that no water leaks in. If water is accumulating in the trunk and no leak is found at the shelf seam, the next area to check is at this melt tape at the trunk flange seam. The tape may sag, leaving a gap behind here where water can enter. This area right here is called the waterfall. To check for a leak here, pull back the carpet and look for water here at the back of the tail light. If there's a leak, you'll see the water enter the trunk when you run a hose over this area. To repair this condition, remove the tail lamp assembly, dry the area completely, apply clear seam sealer, and work it in to fill the gap. Another leak that can cause water to run down over this same area is back here at the corner gutter. Water from this leak will generally appear a little further back in here as it's coming under this panel. Again, you would apply clear sealer to repair this leak. On some earlier vehicles, another possible source of water leaking into this area could be a pinhole here, where the fender metal overlaps. Even a very tiny hole can let a lot of water come in. The air hose and soap solution will detect a leak here. Clear sealer will take care of pinhole leaks also. Another less likely cause for water in the same area would be an incorrectly seated trunk weather strip seal here, where the flange metal overlaps. Be sure the weather strip is firmly seated on the flange. If you find a really considerable quantity of water in the trunk at either of the wheel housings, check for a missing body plug in the rear trunk panel. 
Here's Brian again. If you get a lot of water, okay, a lot of water in your, in your tire well, okay. all of a sudden say, whoa, look out. It's right here, you got a plug here. It's missing. All right. All right, that's your number one indicator. And I've had a couple of dealers tell me about that. Same with this side. There's a plug here. Okay. Okay. That's just a regular body plug. And exactly. It, and it's in it's a little plastic plug. Oh, this is it, a big round one, that's a smaller one. And it's inside this uh, yeah. box section here that's for right. the back panel. Okay. Yeah, it's put on before. Now, if they miss that by accident, that's where you'll get your big pile of wire. Okay. You can seal the plug hole with an adhesive patch. Okay. That's what the only thing you can do if you don't have a plug. Okay. And that'll stick pretty well. Before we leave the trunk, there's another possible leak source that's perhaps a little more surprising. It's right here, where the roof ditch molding meets the rear window, or backlight as it's also called. Water may run from here, down the back pillar, and collect in the trunk. But depending on the direction the water takes inside the body, the leak here can also result in water collecting on the floor by the back seat. You can trace the path of the interior leak by feeling for water here below the sail panel, oh, yeah. beside the rear seat. Okay. To check for a leak at the ditch seal, loosen the door seal a little. Remove the coat hook and carefully pull back the headliner enough where you can get the compressed air nozzle into the body panel below the ditch molding. Put this on it here, okay? Yep. And you put it in. Yeah, you put it in this way. And there's a panel that goes down there, okay? You'll feel, you'll feel like an overlapping panel. You put this right, you slide it underneath, put it right there, and put the soap on it, and you'll see it leaking, you'll see it blowing out the back end. So that's between the inner and the outer roof panel. That's right. There was one other rear floor leak that, again, was confined to very early production cars. It was here, at the quarter glass on the rear door. There are three clips that hold this outer reveal molding on the door. If these clips were not positioned correctly, the molding would sit up allowing water to pass through this seam between the outer and inner moldings. Water from this leak would run down through the door pad and come out along here and run onto the floor. The leak would seem like a water deflector leak, but those simply do not occur on Regal and Century due to door trim design and the water management system in the rear doors. Also, no weather strip leaks have occurred on these cars. One sure sign of this leak is water coming from the lamp housing in the door trim pad right here. To repair this condition, first remove the door pad and place butyl patches in the holes from this side. Then, remove the outer reveal molding and place a piece of foam tape along the width of the quarter glass. Here's Brian again. All you're doing is damming it so it cannot get underneath. Right. That's all you're doing. Right. So it, all the water will come on top. And you won't see any of this. When it's put back on, it's tight enough that you won't see it. The reason I put glue on it is because it doesn't attach it to it. It's just stuffed in there. Yeah. So you want to glue it so it'll hold something to it. Okay. So you just very lightly glue it. Use that stuff. Wet your finger. Go across like that. Bang. It's also possible for this ditch molding leak to occur at the windshield. <laughs> the ditch seam at the front yeah. will do one of two things. If it's leaking, it will leak. The same as it does um, in the rear door. It will leak right here underneath the carpet. Okay. All right. With a leak at the front of the ditch molding, water could come down the pillar, this time the A-pillar, onto the carpet. This condition is rare. In fact, of all the cars that have been built, Brian had only seen one case like this to date. Part of the reason for this is the wet pillar water management system used on Regal and Century. Now, you can spend all your life fixing these areas because, you know, through normal process this happens, you, you will get a skip here or right. something. So you constantly work in at six areas. It's a big time repair for the dealer, for everybody. Yeah. Or you turn around and say, well, let me manage the water. So you take the bottom baffle, which right. is sealed, and you put a little chiclet in there. That, uh, it's like a little plug that causes the, causes the expandable to come back a little bit, creates a little funnel hole, and it'll go out. You can't even see it. With the wet pillar system, a specially designed piece of rubber, or chiclet as it's known in the plant, is used at the bottom of the pillar. This chiclet helps keep out road noise and allows water to drain from the pillar so it doesn't accumulate inside the car. However, a leak at the front ditch seal could run around the door lace molding, across the door sill, and back into the rear where it accumulates by the back seat. So if you have water in the rear and no other leaks can be found, check this area. 
In the course of producing the Buick know-how programs, new or different information often becomes available to us after the initial videotaping has been done. Such is the case on this release. Regal and Century were still relatively new models when we taped the original show. Right now, I'm on the set of our 1998 new model program with a white 1998 Regal instead of the black one we used earlier. If I switch from one car to the other, you'll understand why. A leak which occurred on an early car was at the housing that holds the air filter in the cowl. In the plant, this part is referred to as the stovepipe. The leak is caused by an incorrect fit of the housing for the HVAC air filter. If the air filter housing does not fit flush over the studs, the expandable seal material here will not fill the space and water will run under this plastic piece, around the blower motor and eventually into the front carpet. The blower motor may also short out. It's barely noticeable, but if you run a hose here, you may actually see the water run under the housing. You will definitely see it come inside. To repair this condition, Brian explained that he removed the housing and cleaned away all the existing sealer. He then applied a bead of liquid rubber under the lip of the housing where it contacts the cowl. Next, he carefully replaced the housing in the opening and let everything dry. Finally, wearing a rubber glove, he applied another coat of liquid rubber around the inside of the housing lip to complete the seal. After leaving the water test area, Ian went to talk with the plant team that test drives several cars every day to evaluate them for squeaks and rattles and wind noise performance. Ian's plant expert in this area was Pat Sirizotti. Notice the Oshawa plant is equipped with the GM road simulator machine we first showed in our know-how from Buick City Assembly in Flint. Again, probably the most remarkable thing about the Regal and Century models produced at the plant is how relatively free they are of squeaks, rattles, and wind noise problems. And the few problems that did arise have been quickly addressed in production. Another noise that appeared on some very early production cars was a flutter that was caused by the front spring touching the metal when the spring was fully compressed, as when going over a bump. The front spring design was altered by the supplier to remedy this condition. If you encounter this condition, you should install a current production spring to eliminate the noise also. Another wheel-related condition that has already been covered in a service bulletin for Regal and Century is a squealing or grinding noise heard from the front brakes. This may be the result of the mounting bracket for the ABS front speed sensor connector being bent and rubbing on the rotor. To correct this problem, you simply have to bend the bracket away so there's a three millimeter clearance gap between the bracket and the rotor. That's about an eighth of an inch. Also, check that the ABS harness does not rub against the CV joint boot. While I'm under here, I want to mention another electrical condition that involves the ABS harness. The harness exits the body here at this pass-through. Over time, the harness could wear through as it rubs against these sharp edges. This could result in a short condition that would cause intermittent ABS operation and the resulting DTCs. You can use a piece of rubber or thick foam around the pass-through opening to form a grommet that would protect the harness from rubbing through. Now, back to squeaks and rattles. Some Regal and Century owners may report a squeak noise coming from the rear strut when it hits a bump, particularly in wet conditions. The squawk is produced by the spring rubbing against the funnel-shaped rubber skirt on the strut assembly. It would actually uh, make a squawking sound, especially when it's wet. And when it's wet, when the car, car hits a bump, the spring will come up and rub against the upper part of the strut, the rubber head of it, and make a squawking sound. What we did to that, we added a, a loop. A potential rattle condition on Century and Regal is produced by loose bolts at the fuel canister. Be sure all the bolts are tight. A squeak can also occur at the rear suspension if the bolt on the stabilizer bar drop link is over tightened. Just loosen the bolt and torque it to the proper specification. Well, that's all under here. Pat pointed out that basically only one wind noise condition has been identified with these cars it can occur at the window run channel at the corner of the mirror patch. Pat explained a kind of sizzling sound occurs if the run channel lip does not fully contact the window glass. In this area, 
does not make contact with the inner part of the glass, you could have a little wind noise. Okay. So this by building up the edge with either a piece of foam in behind, right? and put it back in position, this will eliminate that. Okay, now th this noise, does it manifest itself as kind of a whistle? Or is it kind of just a kind it of sounds, a little droning? It sounds uh, like uh, your frying eggs, like, you know, like a little sizzle. Kind of a sizzle to it. Like a sizzle to okay, it. all right. Try placing a piece of foam tape behind the channel to build it up so that it seals properly. If you can't get a good seal that way, replace the run channel. One other much less likely cause of wind noise would be a poor front door fit that didn't allow the molding here to fit snugly against the pillar. We'll look at door fit a little later. Some early Regal and Century customers commented on a scraping noise they would hear as the driver's side window was lowered. This noise was caused by the electric motor harness rubbing against the window regulator as it traveled down. If you run into this condition, you can easily check if the harness is the cause. Just remove the switch panel as Pat is doing here. Then lower the window to see if the harness. noise is gone when you hold the harness clear. Loaded, if so it's gone, you've nailed the cause and you can reroute the harness so it doesn't contact the regulator. The regulator going down, and you will hear that. Another window related noise on the rear doors of very early production cars was a rattle or rumble that was heard when the door was closed. When you shut the rear door, when you close the rear door, you had a rattle condition. And this was caused by the electric motor was hitting the inside of the door pad itself, and this is, is like a rumble when you shut the door. So. This condition was addressed by the pad supplier adding an additional piece of material to the door pad, so it's thicker and provides more dampening for the motor. You can simulate this repair by adding a piece of foam or similar material to the door pad to cushion the motor. Now, let's look at some interior conditions that Pat described to us. On early cars, an itching noise would sometimes be heard at the instrument panel. The noise is produced by the IP rubbing against the gauge cluster. To prevent this noise, all you need to do is put some foam tape behind the IP to prevent it from rubbing on the cluster. Another interior condition that Regal or Century owners may comment on is the fit of the glove compartment. In some cases, the gap may be a little more narrow at the top right corner than the left side gap. To remedy this condition, remove the three screws below the glove box door and install three shim washers with the screws. A three millimeter washer should be used here on the right, a one and a half mil here, and a half mil here. Another minor condition that owners may comment on concerns the amount of side to side movement allowed by the louvers that direct the airflow from the IP air vents. In some very early build cars, it's possible the wrong louvers may have been used, in which case you would replace the vent. More likely, though, the louvers have simply shifted on the plastic gear that moves them. If that's the case, you simply take a flat tool and gently press against the louvers at the gear and move them to the desired position. Another condition may sometimes be found on cars that have had the hush panel below the steering column removed for service. It's possible that one of the plastic fasteners that attaches the hush panel to the IP carrier may have been broken during removal, or the fastener hole in the carrier may have been broken. In either case, the hush panel may be loose and rattle against the IP carrier. To repair this condition, use a new fastener or a suitably sized sheet metal screw. If the hole in the carrier is broken, you can repair it with a small piece of sheet metal or a J-clip to form a new mounting hole. If that's not feasible for a good repair, you can also drill a new hole close to the broken one and use a sheet metal screw. Since the area is not visible to the occupants, it isn't really necessary to use a fastener that matches the original. Another possible source for a squeak noise on very early cars was the area where the deck lid bumper touches the body. A patch is now used in this area. Uh, it sounds like a loud squeak when you go over a bump, mm -hmm. and this patch was supposed to reduce that is to eliminate the friction between the hard rubber and the paint. This is an early pilot car that doesn't have the patch yet. The next person Ian spoke with at the plant was Tom McLeish. Tom handles body fit concerns in the plant quality audit area. Like the other areas we've looked at, Tom pointed out that Regal and Century are relatively free of body fit problems. 
Ian asked Tom for hints on how to address situations where owners may possibly comment on fit around the trunk. Starting with this area here, where the corner of the deck lid meets the body panel. Let's say, for example, the deck lid seemed a little high or low in relation to the body. The first thing to check is the bumper. Make sure it's contacting the body properly when the trunk is closed. If the bumper adjustment is okay and the lid is slightly high or low, then the hinge can be adjusted slightly to compensate. You wouldn't touch this bolt back here. You'd loosen these two up here. Okay. And you just tilt it as you need it. Just, just a small amount this That's way. Right. Whatever you need, up okay. or down. All right. Don't, don't touch this one back here. The rear one. Just do these two. Tom pointed out that the rear bolt that joins the hinge to the body should not be loosened to make adjustments. Loosening this bolt will affect the geometry of the hinge. It is only removed when the hinge must be replaced. Only the two forward bolts should be loosened and the hinge should be adjusted in small increments, about one mil at a time until the proper alignment is achieved. If the gap here between the deck lid and the body is perceived to be too wide, then the upper hinge that's bolted to the lid can be adjusted to remedy this condition. Be sure to mark the hinge for position first before loosening these bolts. And remember, if one hinge is adjusted, the one on the other side must be adjusted equally so the lid is not twisted. Because of their design, door fit concerns have been minimal on Century and Regal. Tom explained that adjustments on the rear door can be made by repositioning the lock striker. No hinge adjustments are necessary. Pull your in out. Yep. If your striker's down too low, it'll bring the door down and keep, keep away from this seal, these two seals. Okay. And, that gen uh, but this, this is a door, door on process when they build this car. They build the side ring as one piece, right? right? And then they, they, they put the door in. There really isn't very, very much that you can do with the door here. No, other than striker. It's unlikely, but if you run into a fit discrepancy at the front door, for instance, if the molding doesn't fit flush against the A-pillar, remove the front lock striker. Then check door alignment with a straight edge here. The front hinge can be adjusted to correct alignment. Just so you're moving it in maybe a mill at a time? A mill at a time. And, and then, and then tighten it up it. and then close it again. So it's even here. You don't use a straight edge for here. Yeah. And then adjust your striker to whatever you need. Well, as you've seen, build quality on Regal and Century is excellent. The concerns we've covered in this program have been addressed at the plant. On behalf of Buick Know How, I want to thank the Oshawa plant personnel for sharing these tips with us. I'm Chuck McLennan. I'll see you in the next program.